Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus. Honored to be joined today at the American Veterans Conference by Jim Lavelle. He's a veteran of the United States Navy, survival of Pearl Harbor. And we're about now to uh, discuss the other major historical event in American history that he was a part of. And sir, when you left off, uh, you were talking about returning to Dallas and you were about to tell us about yeah. your yeah. latest employment move. Uh, when I, when I uh, quit uh, the job I had there in California and uh, came back to Texas, uh, I went, uh, eventually went to work for the federal government uh, as an auditor, auditing accounts for them. And, uh, and then the, I saw an ad for the, uh, by the Dallas Police Department for police officers, and I went down and signed up and took their examination. And uh, fortunately, I think I passed, out of the 15 or 20 or so that took the test, I think I ended up being number two or three on it. So I felt good about that. And, and I went to work in 1950 with the Dallas Police Department. And at that time, uh, you had to stay in patrol for five years to get a little experience on it, which is a good idea. I think they've shortened it now. But you had to stay five years before you could take a promotional examination. So in about 56 or 7, I took my promotional examination and become a detective. And shortly thereafter, I moved into uh, the Homicide Division and stayed there the rest of my career. Uh, and uh, just about, I, I moved out for a short time into the uh, 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 another division for a while, and then before I retired. But uh, in the while I was in the uh, with the homicide division, they was we had a lot of different things happen, but. In 1963, when the President Kennedy come for a visit, why well, he was assassinated, and uh, one of the things that happened after the after his assassination was Oswald, who had shot the president, uh, made his way to Oak Cliff, and he was stopped on the street because he's walking along at a pretty fast clip, and uh, Officer J. D. Tippett stopped him and to question him, uh, something that back in the, my years earlier, uh, I've done it many, many times, you'd stop somebody because you're looking for someone, and they had given him a general description of what Oswald looked like because what they had from the people that saw him in the window when the shots were fired. So he stopped and just merely that questioned him about uh, uh, what his name and so forth. <coughs> but uh, I had to, uh, four good witnesses that was a witness to the shooting of uh, Tippett, and uh, all of them gave the, about the same description that they said that uh, when Tippett pulled up on the side of the street there and called Oswald over, uh, he was driving along about 10 miles an hour. Actually, that wasn't his beat because they took the man out of, called the man out from that beat and worked downtown and they called Tippett in from the outlying area to cover that cover that particular area. So uh, he just pulled him over and I'd done the same thing many times. I'd looking for somebody and I'd see somebody walking along the street that resembled him. I would stop him and talk to him and of course 99 times out of 100 you sent them on the way because they wouldn't know who you are looking for. That's what would have happened with the uh, with uh, Tibbet, had uh, Oswald been able to think long enough uh, about it, because Tibbet had called him over to the car door, and uh, he leaned in and talked to him, they said, for a few seconds, and then Tibbet got out and started walking around the front of the car to get to him, and Oswald stepped back two or three feet, and when Tibbet got to the left front fender of the car, uh, Oswald pulled out his pistol and went into that marine stance that he'd been taught and just bang, 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 bang four times, just like that. He didn't move his gun up and down, he had left it steady. And so the first shot that hit uh, uh, Tippett was down, was low along the belt area and the next one a little higher. And what, uh, what, what caused it, what he did is he, let, he went forward 
with the first shot and he's starting turning to his left and another, the bullet w w w walked on up his body as he fell. And the last one, uh, when he was going down, he fell on his left side and as he went down on the left, uh, on there, his head passed the line of view, line of shots, and the bullet hit him uh, in the temple and come out the top. Now we have a lot of a lot of conspiracy people uh, saying that Oswald walked around the car, back of the car, very nonchalant-like, and shot him in the temple because of that uh, the direction of the bullet. Well, I served as a te technical advisor for Oliver Stone when he made the Jake JFK movie, and when he come to that, we had a little discussion about it. He wanted to write that uh, Oswald, some idiot had said that they, Oswald just casually walked around the car and shot him in the head. Because uh, that's the only way they'd had that bullet going at an angle through his head. But I told Stone, I said, that ain't the way it happened. And, and so I said, if, uh, that when I, I, cause when, I, when Oswald finished up, he turned to run, he run by the, porch where the Davis sisters were sta standing and kicked the empty holes out of his gun and they passed the cab driver over there that had a clear view of it and as he passed that he said the, he said to himself the poor dumb cop or the poor damn cop the driver wasn't sure what he said but that told me that uh, uh, Oswald had no intention of shooting that officer he, he just didn't know what, if he'd just been using his head a little bit and gave Tippett his identification and everything, Tippett would have looked at it and passed him on. With, oh, but he, but Oswald wasn't thinking fast enough to do that. And uh, of course, then the conspiracy people got to come out with this as he came around the car. Of course, the most silliest thing about all of that uh, uh, analysis is here he's done just killed the president and then killed a police officer. And he's going to casually take time to walk around the car and shoot shoot him again? No, it ain't going to happen. And uh, and I explained to uh, to when he was making the movie what had happened. And Oliver's uh, well, kind of questioned it, and I said, "Well, uh, let me gut shoot you and see if you won't turn around or stoop over." But he didn't want to go that far. So, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, that, that's that, that's what happened there, and then uh, he went on up, took off, and as he's running across the the uh, parking area there, a lot that didn't have any cars on it to speak of, and there was a uh, used car lot down on the corner, and that uh, of that block, and that man that owned it and his. Uh, uh, a tenant had worked him there. They run out and they saw Oswald with the pistol still in his hand and running across there and he had a tan jacket on and he was smart enough to know that the, if he got described, they'd describe the, that he's wearing a tan jacket. So he took that jacket off and tried to throw it underneath the car as he went by. And of course, with their information, we recovered the jacket and then Marina later identified the jacket as his <laughs> so uh, and then he went on and went up Jefferson Street and then I guess he saw two police cars coming and he turned into a shoe store and uh, pretend to be looking at shoes except the shoe store owner didn't have any customers he's standing in the back of his store and listening to the, all this going on on the radio because every radio and every TV was covered with it and he saw Oswald come in and pretend to be looking at shoes, but he's, he's looking over his left shoulder. And these two police cars went by, and then he walked out to the sidewalk area and looked both ways and then headed west again. So that made him suspicious, and he followed him. And when he got up to the, uh, the uh, Texas Theater, instead of buying a ticket, he just darted in the door, went in and sat down. So the shoe store man, he uh, uh, told the ticket seller there. He said, I think the man that shot the officer just went in here. He said, you ought to call the police. So they called and, and the rest is history because they swarmed on there and arrested him and he fought, tried to fight with them, but they overpowered him, brought him in. So he was brought in uh, as a suspect in the killing of, of 
uh, Tippett. He wasn't brought in for the president deal yet. And uh, consequently, when I got to come in and was signed to him, or, well, I actually went out to where Tippett was shot and then tried to go to the theater, but the traffic was such I couldn't get there. And I uh, uh, called the dispatcher and told them to tell them to take him to my office and I'd meet him there. So, But they were driving a marked car and I was driving a plane car and they got there ahead of me. When I got in, he was sitting in an interrogation room by himself. And so I walked in and sat down and started talking to him. And uh, about Tippett, I didn't mention the president because I had no idea he was going to be a suspect in that too. And I had him some 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 20 at the most, before Captain Fritz came back from the school book depository where he was, uh, he and the, the other officers had been searching. Of course, when they went into the, the school book depository, they went in expecting to find a stranger. They weren't looking for an employee. But when they didn't find no stranger, then he asked the, uh, Mr. T Tr Truly, the manager, to do a head count. Well, Oswald was the only one missing, and he kept and said, I want to talk to that man, give me his address. So they gave him his address and everything, but he had given them a phony address. He didn't live there when they were out there. So the cap come in and in a flurry and was gathering up people to go send different directions to look for him uh, from the best information he could gather. And uh, uh, somebody in the office there said, the captain, the man Lavelle's talking to you, got a name similar to that because he had told him he wanted to look for somebody named Oswald. And that shows you how closely they was playing to attention to the prisoners that brought in. And so Cap come to the door and opened it and asked me what his name was, and I told him, and then he asked the officer, where do you work? Uh, he said, at the school book depository. The captain says, you're the man I want. So I lost my prisoner. The captain took over, and, and I never questioned him any further. But I already had pretty good information from him as it was to help me but he was assigned to me as my prisoner, therefore everything that took place went through me. And when he was, when we was transferring him, it was still my, since he was my prisoner, it was up to me to uh, head up the moving. And that's what, what I did, and that's how I come out of being handcuffed. That was one question that's been asked quite a bit, why was I handcuffed to him? Mm -hmm. But he was, he was my prisoner, he was assigned to me. And when Ruby stepped forward, yeah, as we got walked into the basement down there uh, on the transfer, uh, I saw Ruby. He was facing me uh, about five or six feet away. And uh, I saw, I, I, I always make it a habit when I go into a room where there's, uh, where I'm doing an investigation, I always look up and down the people that I see. And I saw Jack Ruby. He was standing right there in front. And he had the pistol in his left hand, holding it against his left leg right tight. And of course, I knew immediately what was going to happen when I saw that. None of the police officers st uh, fell in that area or the newspaper people saw that pistol in his hand. Of course, I gave them a bad time later on, all of them. I said, if y'all had been looking up sharp enough, you'd look and saw him with that pistol. You could have wrestled him down there and you could have been heroes. But as it is, you left it for me to be uh, to confront him. So uh, I, uh, just as I, as I walked in, and he made two quick steps, brought, which brought him into arm's length to me, and I reached over uh, past Oswald and caught him by the, the uh, left shoulder and was pushing back. But he had switched the pistol over to his right hand and, and shot. Of course, I, I jerked Oswald back, trying to pull him behind me so as a rut when I when I jerked back on him, I turned his body. Instead of the bullet hitting him dead center, it hit him about four inches to the left of the navel on the left side, and went through the uh, stomach and uh, 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 hit cut the vena cava in the back and went over on the, through the left or the right side, hit the, the liver, took a chunk out of that, and then cut the, one of the main arteries over on the right side and hit the end of the seventh rib and shattered it and glanced off and landed about three or four inches to the right, almost even with where it went in on the, on the right side. Hmm. Uh, in fact, if it hadn't been for that 
the rib catching that bullet. It, it, if it had missed it, it'd come on and hit me in the side over here. But it hit that rib and bounced off. And when I examined him later on, I could uh, roll that bullet around underneath the skin just like that with my thumb and finger. So when I got him to the hospital, we, they, they called an ambulance right away. And there happened to be one that was returning to their office from a call. And they and they uh, accepted the the uh, call and come up there. So we they were there very shortly. Uh, when I got him to the hospital out there and rolled him into the operating room, the doctors was already there, ready to go. And uh, I told him, I said, before you do anything else, I want that bullet out of him. So they and I showed them where it was, and they just pinched it up and hit it with a scalpel, and it popped out into a tray that our nurse was holding. I wiped it off with some cl uh, Kleenex or something and then took my pocket knife and uh, had a sharp knife point on it and I gave it to the nurse that was holding the tray and I told her, I said, I want you to scratch your initial on the butt end of this bullet because you and I, somewhere down the line, is going to be testifying that this is a bullet come out of Oswald. And she did that and uh, I testified two or three times. I know she did once, but I tested about two or three different times when they was having uh, hearings on on Ruby. <coughs> uh, then I went, uh, I, I then returned to the office and uh, made, made up the case report for filing on, on him for the murder. Of course, I did, uh, what I did was just file a, a, uh, a uh, bill for the grand jury to look at because He's dead, so you can't do anything with him. But so, but I, I did. I felt like uh, they needed to hear it. So, I mean, of course, they took no action on it. Uh, because, well, yeah, they did. I was saying they took no action. They did uh, indict Ruby for murder, and we tried him the following year and got the death penalty on him. But the. Uh, Court of Criminal Appeals uh, overturned it and sent it back for retrial. Uh, it, it seems like that the judge that was here in the case was writing a book about the trial, and they were afraid that he was going to, he would use uh, some uh, some decision make some decision in the favor of his book rather than the prisoner. I don't know that he would do it, but the obvious would be there that it might, might, might be what happened. Right. So they overturned it, and I think it's a pro proper thing to do uh, that they did. And we reset him for trial in uh, um, February the 10th of 1967. And uh, he died on, on January the 4th or 5th of 1967 of, of cancer that he had developed while in jail. Sir, we're just about out of time. Uh, how long did you serve in the police force before retiring? Uh, something over 25 years, 25 years and three or four months, something like that. Sir, thank you for your service. Thank you for coming to the conference, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, you're quite welcome. Thank you.